The first poem you ever wrote was the first breath you ever took. Each day you write a new line. Each moment has the potential for your next rhyme. Choose your words carefully. Storytelling allows us to witness the world from a different vantage point, to see another piece of a larger incomplete truth. Art invites us to listen, to breathe in, to make space for the experience of being surprised. Today you may see and hear things that resonate deeply with you. You may also see and hear things that are very new or different from your own experiences, and this may be uncomfortable. If this happens, try to be open and consider the personal experiences and perspectives that your fellow Bruins are sharing with you. At UCLA, we believe that the freedom to speak and express one's thoughts, values, and voice is integral to the fabric of our community and transcends our environment. Our goal today is to spark ongoing conversation and reflection. And we aim to do this with performances that do not malign or attack. If you want to talk more about anything that you witness in today's event, please reach out. Know that we are here to support you, both while you are a student and beyond. We invite you today to listen, to breathe in, to make space for learning from your fellow Bruins. This is Bruin Life. Hauka, may the fire in your heart continue to burn brightly. This is the people's land. People. Amat. Land. Kwahan. Truth. One that is good. One that is right. We are the Kumiai. People looking from a steep place. Below my feet is the land. Below that, my ancestors. The Kumeyaay have always been here. We were here before they called it San Diego, and we will be here long after. This land is who we are. She's a part of us. There are no borders here. We are responsible to the land. UCLA occupies Tongva territory. Tavangar sustained me throughout my undergraduate education and early adulthood. This land gave so much to me. She held me up while I learned more about myself and the world. She comforted me in times of trouble and celebrated me in times of triumph. Over time, I felt a shift in our relationship. I went from being a guest to a relative, and with that change came new responsibility. I found ways to connect with her. Kuravanga, Pavanga. Yanga, these are the words she longs to hear. I found ways to give back, to be in reciprocity, to offer her parts of myself to help sustain her while she continues to sustain so many. When we occupy others' homelands, it becomes our responsibility to take care of the land that takes care of us. We must all become stewards. The land is our relative. She holds us accountable. Her struggle is our struggle. Wherever you are, acknowledge the land and give back. Show her gratitude. Be responsible. UCLA sits on Tongva territory. What does that mean? It means before Los Angeles morphed into a major city and a desert, it was home to native people who filled the land with tule reed and willow homes. It was beautiful, lush green wetlands. It was abundant with natural food and clean, drinkable water. In under 300 years, America has managed to destroy such beauty and health into what we see today. But hope is not lost. As long as you are here, you too have become stewards of the land by doing your best to minimize your footprint, educating yourself on local issues, standing with us during our struggles and fights to protect land, water, and clean up contamination. You prove to be good stewards of the land, continuing healthy life for the next seven generations.
Newest Bruins, welcome to UCLA and welcome to the start of a journey unlike any other. I'm UCLA's Chancellor, Jean Block, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging our institution's presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. I want to thank our Tongva community partners for reminding us that we're all stewards of the land on which our campus sits. This is no doubt an exhilarating, though perhaps daunting moment for all of you as you begin a life-changing personal and intellectual adventure at the nation's number one public university. Alongside this change in your own lives, you enter a UCLA at a time of incredible transformation within society. The world is grappling with a global pandemic. America is struggling to address long-standing racial injustice, and we stand on the cusp of an immensely consequential U.S. presidential election just a few short weeks away. UCLA is changing, too. To keep everyone safe, the majority of our classes are being offered remotely, and fewer students than usual are living on campus. But our faculty and staff have been preparing for this, and I promise that this quarter, while unique, will still be a deeply enriching one that helps you build connections to our campus and to each other. Your incoming class of 10,200 new Bruins is absolutely brimming with talent and distinction. 130 of you were student body presidents. 192 were academic decathlon participants. 175 of you were black belts. Some of you delivered medical supplies to refugees, and some of you were world-class musicians. A third of you were the first in your family to attend college. Your classmates will be central to your UCLA experience. They will help you expand your interests and deepen your understanding of yourself and of the world. I know your class is already buzzing with energy and connecting on social media, and you'll have another chance to connect through UCLA's Common Experience Program, which fosters discussion among newly admitted students based on a single theme and work of art. This year's theme is Minds Matter, a focus on mental health. And we'll explore that subject through an animated series, BoJack Horseman. I'm excited to see how the community will come together for screenings, discussions, and art projects related to this topic and show. For all of us, this academic year will be a grand experiment in collective responsibility and community building. In the past few months, you've had to make many changes in support of the common good, from wearing a mask, to adjusting how you spend your time, to seeing friends over Zoom. These personal sacrifices, acts of care and compassion made for the sake of the greater community, will need to continue as we work to limit the spread of COVID-19 virus in Westwood and around the world. It is useful to practice this care and compassion too, because these traits have always been central to building healthy communities on diverse college campuses. And trust me when I say that UCLA is diverse. The youngest person in your class is 14. The eldest is 67. Among you are transfer students alongside those right out of high school. You come from 46 U.S. states and more than 50 countries. At UCLA, we have veterans and civilians, artists and tech entrepreneurs, conservatives and progressives, and people from whom labels have no meaning. We have Bruins who speak dozens of different languages, have different sexual orientations, and practice a multitude of religions. We welcome and cherish every one of these individuals as equal members of our community. Given this diversity, our respect and care for one another, despite our differences, is necessary to create a community where we learn from and with each other. Even when we disagree with a person's ideas, we must respect that person's humanity. I learned from teaching on Zoom this past spring the importance of remembering that we're not just tiny boxes on a screen. There's a real person on the other end of that video call, a person with their own history, dignity, strengths and weaknesses, who can be brilliant and who can make mistakes. Our community ties can be strained in times of crisis, and they can be tested in an election year. Remember that passion can make you strong, but compassion can make you wise. A compassionate community is a resilient one where we feel brave enough to take risks, to move past stereotypes, to open ourselves up to new ideas and the insights of others. 
There's something else I want to remind you about with regard to respect. Sexual assault, relationship violence, and stalking are crimes against the dignity and safety of individuals, against the values of our community, and against the law. They will be treated as such. Pay attention to the Student Code of Conduct and the University of California policy on sexual violence. Understand what consent means. Know your own boundaries and respect the boundaries of others. If you encounter sexual misconduct of any kind, please report it immediately to UCLA's Title IX office or off-campus authorities. Newest Bruins, as you settle into the fall term, please take good care of yourselves and take care of each other, and know that the UCLA faculty and staff are here to support you if you need it, whether it's planning your class schedule, seeking financial assistance, finding clubs to join, or receiving counseling. This is a challenging time that's making big demands on all of us. Remember, you can always ask for help. Once again, I'm delighted to have you join our thriving community. You bring to UCLA your intelligence, energy, creativity, curiosity, and an eagerness to seize this transformative moment to reshape the world into a better one. We are so thrilled to have you join us as fellow Bruins. And with that, on with the show. The world right now is how I remember college hangovers, except this is the world stone cold sober. As we sit inside a literal reckoning of race and power, our system seemingly collapsing all around us, I am here to tell you that you have power, despite the fact that you can't get a haircut. When I entered UCLA in 1996, I had dreams of becoming a famous artist, but not the family to guide me on how to do this. My grandparents were immigrants from Southern China and they built their American dream in the garment industry. My parents were the first generation to go to college and they were anxious to leave the thread and fabric life behind. My mom got a stable job as an accountant, but she still taught me how to sew. Thanks to mentors I made at UCLA, I did find a way to make a career as a performance artist and my parents for the most part have accepted it. Uh, the sewing skills that I inherited are used to make the sets for my show, like this presidential seal behind me. I should be on my national tour of Christina Wong for public office about how I ran and won a local seat on my neighborhood council. I, I ran because in November 2016, it felt like politicians and artists had switched jobs. They now create the shock and spectacle that have us questioning reality. We now create the social change. Now I'm both an artist and an elected representative. In January, I didn't even know how to sew a mask. In fact, I refused to wear a mask as a form of protection. You see, I already walk around the world with this mask on, the one that I can't take off, the one that tells most of the world, oh, maybe she brought COVID here. I wasn't about to put this mask on top of this mask and get the same stares that I was unintentionally giving to older Asian people in my neighborhood who were wearing masks. But then, in March, my nurse friend messaged me and told me that her hospital was telling them to tie bandanas around their face. And it became clear to me that masks were a legitimate form of protection and there were not enough to go around. I now lead the Auntie Sewing Squad, a volunteer group that makes masks for the most vulnerable of communities. We started in late March with 10 volunteers. We now have hundreds of aunties all over the country. It's no surprise that most of our aunties are women of color. We learned our garment making skills from our mothers who passed those skills on to us. In fact, my mother and her friends are part of the squad and I get to order them around along with hundreds of other folks. Together to date, we have distributed 70 thousand masks. We've been on CNN, Good Morning America, NBC, and we even have a book deal. And I would trade all those accolades in if it meant that communities would no longer have to deal with the stress of not having one of these. In this crisis, the heroes are the ordinary people, the people who risk their lives to go to the meatpacking factory, to drive buses and deliver mail. 
You've likely heard this too many times this year, but this is an unprecedented moment in history. Systems need to be rebuilt. It's not clear who's in charge or if the people who are in charge know what to do. All hands on deck means that we all have the potential to do something of value, whether it's to protest injustice or provide critical aid to those in need or getting out the vote. And if you can't vote because of your citizenship status or maybe you're a Doogie Hauser or a child genius who started college early, good on you. Get your friends to go out and vote for the things that you care about. And heck, why not just run for office? I did and, won. and now I make medical equipment on a Hello Kitty sewing machine with my UCLA degrees in English and World Arts and Cultures. It's all possible. Maybe there's a geography major who will find the vaccine next quarter. Listen, I know things are a little stressful with the whole humanity existential threat thing, but uh, here's the good news. The rapture is playing out a lot slower in real life than it does in a movie. So we still have time to support others and make change. Show up big in life because when you show up for yourself, you show up for the world. I prayed for months to get into UCLA. My pastor, Dr. Juan William Sear, told me to hold fast to my confession of faith. As a native of Rialto, California, raised by a single mother and incarcerated father, I cherished family and needed that external support from church. So while facing an eviction and commuting on the bus for two hours, my prayer every day was thanking God for preparing me for UCLA. And when I received that congratulatory email, my house was in an uproar. It worked. What I didn't know then was how my faith would be tested. And my faith was tested in the form of identity shock. There was Dante, student leader in the African Student Union and Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. There was Dante, who sought after a righteous relationship with God. There was Dante, who was learning so much about power and racism and wanted to just change the world. What kept me going was the village of faculty and staff who allowed me to just be. What do I pray for now? My faith teaches me that I'm loved, set apart by God. But somehow in this world, that may not protect me from violence based on this skin, this body that I'm in. Wasn't Timur Rice also special? Wasn't Sandra Bland also set apart? How about Breonna Taylor or George Floyd? What is my confession of faith now? I'm now obtaining my doctorate in education to break generational curses and leave a lasting impact for my family and beyond. UCLA was my start to this scholarly journey where I began to investigate a more equitable model for this world. Because after all of our experiences, is this really the best we can do? COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement are forcing us to reimagine our collective aspirations. I'm Dante, walking in faith in pursuit of my destiny in heaven and on earth. And I demand heaven and earth for Black people of all faiths and identities. For Black women, men, trans, and queer folks. I demand that we eradicate systems of inequity in healthcare, housing, and basic needs that we fill a UCLA graduation with more than 10% of us represented, all while trusting God that we may have life and life more abundantly. Over the next few years, you'll discover your power and the strength of your squad. Seize this moment. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. When I was younger, my brothers and I, we would go work on my dad. He was a carpenter, like Jesus. And he had a big Mexican bigote that I always wanted. You know, my dad, like a lot of undocumented workers, was proud of the work that he did, that he could build something from nothing. And I remember going to work with my dad, and he would always tell me, Hey, mijo, get your hands out of your pocket. Y ponte a trabajar. My dad died five years ago without ever getting legal documentation. He got caught with drugs when he was 18 years old, an unforgiving crime. So he was always living in the shadows. I never got as good as my dad in carpentry. I could never grow that Mexican bigote. But I knew I wanted to build something. And I wanted to clap back at, at all those people that would talk about my dad as gangbangers, as criminals, as lazy. Lazy. 
I remember my dad, he used to tell me, hey, mijo, how long does it take for a Mexican to, oh, they're done. See, my dad used to love to tell jokes, stories, and histories, but those all went with him. There's a saying that when an elder dies, that a library is gone forever. I lost that chance to tell my dad's story, but he never let me put my head down, put my hands in my pocket. Hey, punto trabajar, my dad used to tell me. That's why I became a doctoral student at UCLA in the Chicano Chicano Studies Department. Because I didn't want anybody to tell that story about my dad, about who he was, where he came from, why he's here. I'm gonna tell that story. I mean, who's gonna write the stories about the lowriders, the swamis, the cucarachas, la bamba? Who's gonna write books about vegan tacos, churros, copal? Yeah, I said vegan tacos. And we gotta tell our own stories. And I realized that the world needs us to remind them that immigrants feel joy and pain, love and vergüenza, and they sure as hell don't like living in cages. We gotta tell our stories, because if we don't, somebody will. And you all have just been accepted to one of the most prestigious and respected universities in the galaxy. Your palabra will go far. So tell us a story that's never been told. Remember something that's been forgotten. Turn his story into her story, into our story. And we got enough walls. Build a bridge. It's not gonna be easy. But like my dad always told me, hey mijo, put that phone down. And let's get to work.
Welcome and congratulations. My name is Karen Omoto and I teach in urban planning and Asian American studies. Hello, this is Tyron Howard, faculty in the School of Education and Information Studies here at UCLA. Hi, my name is Adriana Galvin and I'm the Dean of Undergraduate Education. I just assumed this role a few weeks ago, so similar to you, although I'm very excited about this coming school year, I am a little bit nervous. But I think that together we'll get through it. We'll find innovative ways to connect, to learn, and to grow. I too came to UCLA as a freshman many years ago and know firsthand how exciting a learning environment UCLA is. But I also know that it's all of you who bring your wisdom, voice, and creativity to enrich that experience for one another and for the faculty. I felt a similar mixture of excitement and trepidation when I left my sunny Southern California hometown to attend a small liberal arts women's college on the East Coast. But I quickly found my way. I felt embraced by the community and empowered to try new things I had never done before. I joined a sorority. I served as an RA in the dorms. And I was one of the few Latino students in the neuroscience major. We so regret that we can't be together at convocation as we typically are. However, we all know that at this point in time, it's best for us to be safe, and that means being safe at home. Nonetheless, we want to welcome you to the Bruin family. We also want to let you know that we want you to do all the things that Bruins do to be successful. Work hard, study hard, manage your time well. Do all the things that you've always done to get to this point. We will come together at some point in time. When, we don't know. But in the meantime, we want you to know that we're thinking about you and that we care about you. I care about you. Just know that like my peers, I do care about all of you. Welcome to UCLA. Hi Bruins. My name is Monroe Gordon and I'm the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs here at UCLA. And I wanna congratulate you on being new Bruins. So I'm coming to you from the amazing grounds here at UCLA. And while I don't have my face covering on any longer, know that all those around me are at safe distances. So let me tell you a little bit more about who I am and what I do here at UCLA. As the Vice Chancellor, I have several responsibilities on this campus. The first thing is to make sure that we're protecting your overall experience as a Bruin. The second is to make sure that we're providing you with opportunities as leaders. And finally, we want to do that in ways that maintain your overall safety and security on the campus. One of the best ways that we maintain safety and security is to ensure that we all understand and that we're following policies and procedures and guidelines that we have on the campus. This is especially important for all of us as we are in this period with COVID-19. By following these guidelines and procedures, it helps to protect not just you, but all of your fellow Bruins within the community. As an alum and a former student athlete here at UCLA, I have to tell you, I've never had a better experience on any college campus, and I'm very hopeful that you will be able to say the same. Just know that I am a part of a group of professionals who are dedicated to working tirelessly every single day on your behalf. Again, let me welcome you Bruins to this campus and congratulate you once more on being a part of the UCLA community. Go Bruins. When I walk into the gym and start warming up, I feel the usual quizzical stares. This isn't my first tournament. I've been playing basketball since I was five years old. When I walk by a team and hear them whisper, they have an Asian? I'm unfazed. This happens to me all the time. The painful absence of Asian Americans in sports is no secret. But instead of feeling discouraged, I feel determined. When I start playing against the same people who doubted me, I let my game speak for itself. Since the eighth grade, I've been determined to play professional basketball. I knew this meant that I had to overcome many fears and obstacles. I originally started playing close to home at Baylor University in Texas. After my sophomore year, I decided to transfer. I wanted a new adventure and the family environment and the UCLA women's basketball team just drew me in. I'm someone who likes routine, so volunteering for change was really scary. But I understood that everything great in my life has pushed me outside of my comfort zone from making the USA youth basketball team and becoming a McDonald's All-American to being with you today virtually. None of this would have happened if I wasn't relentless. 
My calling is to use the platform I have as a student athlete to be a role model for Asian American youth. I want them to be encouraged to pursue their own goals and to fight the stereotypes. Representation is so important. Whether it be on the court or in politics, having role models to look like you is vital. It gives you a sense of hope. And this matters now more than ever. COVID is deeply affecting the lives of Asian Americans. As public officials call it the Chinese virus or Kung Flu, people all across the country who look like me have become targets, experiencing increased rates of hate crimes. In March, I decided to speak up against this racism. I didn't see many people addressing it, so I tweeted about it. I wanted to highlight what Asian Americans are experiencing and call people to do better. Soon, I had ESPN and the LA Times wanting me to describe how I've been affected by the ignorance of others. At UCLA, you will have countless opportunities to learn about others. Be open and don't limit yourself. This world needs us to fight for what is right, even if it is against the status quo. Now is the time to act against the injustices that are so ingrained in this nation's history. At UCLA, about 4,000 undergrads are members of 67 different fraternities and sororities. Our first Greek letter org was founded in 1923, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, a historically black sorority. UCLA is also home to the country's first Asian Greek council, one of the six UCLA Greek councils. Here, Vanessa and Jack share their experiences in Panhellenic and IFC orgs. I joined my sorority after I was handed a flyer on Bruin Walk. I figured, why not? I joined on a whim too. I heard that my fraternity was reestablishing based on values of respect and character. I wanted to challenge the stereotype that fraternities and sororities are just about partying, drinking, and sex. Mm -hmm. And at UCLA, it's not uncommon for me to be the only Latinx person in the room. So I was nervous to join Alpha Gam because I thought that would happen here too. But on my first visit, I saw so much diversity in ethnicity, body size, and majors. I quickly realized how much everyone cared about each other and I felt like I could fit in. I've had experiences with being scared of fitting in too. Since I grew up in a small conservative town, I was scared to come out. But I grew more confident in myself the more time I spent at UCLA. At the end of my freshman year, during a hike with three of my closest fraternity brothers, I felt ready to share my secret. I said, guys, I have something to tell you. I'm gay. You're expecting the worst, I know, but their reaction was amazing. One said that he loved me even more because of it and was proud of me for coming out. I felt empowered. At our next chapter meeting, I announced, I came out of the closet. Every brother clapped and hollered for me. It's incredible that you found such an amazing support system. I feel the same way about my Alpha Gam sisters. But the more involved I became with the Panhellenic Greek Council, the more I saw that stereotypes and traditions need to be addressed. Like one time when I recruited a potential new member, I could tell that she wanted to ask something but was hesitating. I usually don't shy away from taboo topics. So I said, do you wanna ask me about drinking? Oh my gosh, you did? Yep, and she nodded, so I said, it's okay to ask. I'm proud that Alpha Gam doesn't haze or pressure members to engage in hookup culture or partying. Normally, being this direct is uncommon, especially during recruitment, but I believe that we should support all women in asking these questions and getting honest answers. Yeah, recruitment can be difficult to navigate. I also find myself pushing my brothers to expand their thinking. Recently, in a group chat, some of my brothers were poking fun at people who state their pronouns. They just didn't see the need for it. I replied by sending a screenshot of my work email signature and commented, well, that's awkward. This gave me a chance to explain how pronouns are pieces of our identity. They should care because using someone's pronouns is a way to respect another person and create an inclusive environment. Yeah. Speaking up is so important. As a recruitment counselor, I have seen multiple invite lists indicating that women of color consistently receive significantly fewer invites to Panhellenic chapters in comparison to white women. 
What's worse, I and many others have noticed that the chapters considered more favorable tend to be the least diverse. We need to shed light on these practices and force change now more than ever. Yeah, and we're doing exactly that simply by joining these orgs. All right, everybody, let's get some things out the way. I am transgender. I was assigned female at birth. I am Tamil, Sri Lankan, American. When I was younger, I looked like this. And nobody gave me flack about it. Everybody just called me a tomboy. This story is not about my queerness, but it is. I remember one day when I was little, I came home complaining about one of my teachers and my appa, my father, said, listen, don't argue with them even if they are wrong, huh? Just put your head down, keep your eyes glued to your books, and then you will succeed. Then after you succeed, you can say any shit you want. The last part, he didn't say. But that was the gist of it. See, my parents were on land that they felt like visitors to. They felt that if they were quiet, that they would at least survive. They just wanted a peaceful life. But this land was my land. I was the first to be born here, in Queens. Not that I remember that shit. Cause... I was raised in Lancaster, a super hick town just one hour away from Los Angeles, where in the mid-1800s, the KKK established its first West Coast church. And the Tamil Sri Lankan community, we were like flies in the buttermilk in Lancaster. But we dubbed the city Sri Lancaster. So one day, I'm in the sixth grade looking like this, and a girl comes up to me and asks me if I'm gay. I mean, she didn't really ask me if I was gay. She was like, are you? And I was like, no. Yikes! So soon after that, I started dressing and behaving like a girl because I didn't want nobody to sniff me out. Because queer people, we have this smell. Just kidding. And on the real, as a kid, I didn't know anything about queer people. All I knew was that you could probably get killed if you were one. And was I really queer? I mean, wasn't I just like a boy in a girl's body? And while I'm trying to navigate all of this, thank God for hip hop in the late 80s. Black MCs talking about their communities, about racism, about the injustice on black lives. Yo, I wanted to be loud like that. I wrote for myself and I wrote to escape. This brown kid stuck in an immigrant family in a hick town. I wrote horribly. But truthfully and honestly, mimicry with humility. And only after surviving being a closeted queer in Lancaster did I slowly make my way back to being a boy at UCLA because I saw other queer folks living out loud and free regardless of the cost. UCLA is where I got to write and perform, write and perform. I tested the waters. I got loud with other loud students about war, injustice, police brutality, racism, just like hip hop told me. But about my queerness, for some reason I couldn't write about that. I mean, everybody knew, right? Like, why did I have to be loud about that too? So crazy how we could love being us and hate it at the same time. Then, right before I graduate UCLA, I come out to my family and it crumbles us. Should I have even told them? Now I became my family's dirty secret. So I moved to New York and it was a really rough time. So I did what I know how to do. I wrote but this time about my queerness and my family. And you know how many people resonated with that shit? You know how many folks, immigrants or not, people of color or not, they felt themselves through my stories? And the biggest lesson, there was a place on this planet that could hold all of me, the stage. Sometimes family is worth investing the time and sometimes not. As for my family, it took a while, but we healed our hurt. I am here because of my teachers. All of them, the ones from inside school, the ones outside of schools, and not the ones I had to stay silent around, but the ones I was vocal with. The ones who didn't scold me, but gently brought me to the light. So what does that look like now for you? How do you, as young people, queer or not queer, experience community through Zoom? You know, the kind of community that challenges you to become more of the you you hid all last year pre-pandemic. As the first class to ever start a school year in a pandemic of this nature, Y'all are going to be the first ones to think about what connection really means to you. How do you want to be loud? What's the game plan going to be? One where we create fake worlds with fake filters holding up fakeness as the real? Or do you want to show up with your flaws, wounds and all, bearing it all to see others bear? Because I am begging you to make this your practice. To be authentically, unapologetically you.
And I beg you to find your teachers and your elders and not just the ones who shine, but the ones who don't. And I demand you, queer or not, to not let any of those internalized phobias get in your way of being that beautiful self you know you've been aching to be. Just start now. Practice who you want to be in quarantine so that once we have the vaccines, you won't be feeling like the real world is so damn dreadful. This world is a shit show and you are our power washers. Remember to honor yourself. I mean, honor each other. Hold space for your friends to crumble and build back up together. Kick up dust together. Be loud together. Yo, I promise that if there's any class of any year that's already successful, it's y'all. The world might be what it is, but we are all waiting on y'all to welcome us to yours. We spend months drilling 25 plus combinations that can be executed to any song. Our stamina and showmanship are constantly put to the test, all in preparation for game day. We do this for an audience that often misses our athleticism, and our performance is simply entertainment. But as a member of a team that performs as a unit, the struggles of that smiling cheerleader are overlooked. Even though I've danced my whole life, when I go into the athletic space, I am confronted with toxic definitions of masculinity that doesn't have room for male dancers. In these moments, I have to keep smiling and swallow my pain. I remember my first encounter with an audience member who found my presence distasteful. He was seated directly in front of me, so I couldn't avoid his pointing finger or his provoking facial expressions. For 30 minutes, I had to smile in the face of mockery. My racial and cultural authenticity when on a team with predominantly white women is called into question too. But I've accepted my difficult pursuit in dancing, all while creating new definitions of masculinity and navigating what it truly means to be authentic. And I'm grateful to say I'm the first male on the UCLA dance team, but I can't simply find someone who can completely relate to my circumstances. What keeps me motivated though are my loved ones, teammates and coaches. They've helped me learn that I can honor myself, my full self. When the LA Times wrote about me, black and Asian male dancers of all ages started contacting me with affirmations and questions. Their messages was a reminder that I'm blazing a path and this is inspiring young boys once like me to pursue their passions amidst the lack of representation. I believe that when we go against the grain and confront the limitations of social categories, we create opportunities for those who never thought they had a chance. And once you realize that the only thing in life you can control is yourself, there's an endless capacity for making change. Hello, New Bruins. I'm Yolanda Copeland Morgan, Vice Provost of Enrollment Management, and I am really excited to welcome you to UCLA. I look forward to meeting you in person someday soon, but for now, I'm happy to be a part of this special welcome and to share with you our Bruin creativity and talent in this new virtual world. Today, you've seen that talent expressed in many personal ways. Each person shared stories about themselves and talked to us about how they found community at UCLA. And I want to thank them for all of their creativity, their openness, their talent, and for sharing their Bruin spirit with us. And I hope that they've inspired you, inspired you to listen and to learn from each other over the next couple of months. You've joined a new class of incredible scholars from California, from across the nation, and from over 50 different countries. And now you're beginning your own unique journey. Whether you're a recent high school graduate, a veteran, a first-generation college student, documented or undocumented, or if you've transferred from a California community college or from another university or college. You bring your own culture and racial backgrounds, your ethnicity, your languages, your gender identity, and life experiences that will enrich the Bruin community. This rich diversity is at the heart of UCLA and at the heart of your UCLA experience. And it can be central to your growth 
as a student today, but more importantly, as a leader tomorrow. At UCLA, we believe you cannot have excellence without diversity. Excellence is already a central part of who you are as a class. You're probably wondering how I know this. Well, I know because we read each of your applications at least twice, and some of them three times, and we found in you those characteristics that will lead you to success at UCLA. We saw academic achievement, determination to excel, and a commitment to learning that will make you thrive here. We look at leadership, but not just leadership that you find as president of an organization. We looked for the kind of leaders that the world needs today, leaders who can bring together people from different backgrounds and achieve a common goal ethical leaders who can overcome our divisions, take on today's challenges, find solutions, and keep us all moving forward. Leaders who are persistent and optimistic, inclusive, and importantly, leaders who are bridge builders. That's what we look for in our leaders at UCLA. That's how we define leadership, and we saw that in each of you. And some of you might be saying, did you really see that in me? The answer is yes, we see that in you. You've all faced challenges at school and sometimes in your home or in the military or in the workforce or in your communities and your personal lives. You've been resilient, which is so important, especially during this pandemic. You've adapted to changes and especially to this online remote environment, but I want you to know our faculty have also adapted in this online remote environment, and they're gonna deliver to you a quality education, and you're gonna have the kind of engagement that will get you excited about learning. Our faculty are ready to engage you and to challenge you and to prepare you for the success that you desire. They'll make you stretch and expect you to be actively engaged in all of your classes. You'll have to bring your online A-game to every class, to every lecture, to the research projects and the laboratories that you'll be a part of. You'll be challenged, but you'll also be amazed and inspired. That's why UCLA is the number one public university in the country. Let me leave you with this thought, New Bruins. While you're in this virtual environment, you know better than we do that you can still make connections with your peers, your fellow Bruins, and I want to encourage you to do that. And I also want to encourage you to take advantage of all of the resources that UCLA offers. It might take you a minute to get familiar with them, but take advantage of them. You're a part of the Bruin community now, and we welcome you to UCLA. I can't wait till we can see each other in person. Meanwhile, be safe and we'll see you soon. Hi, I'm Maria Blandizi and I'm your Dean for Students. Hi, my name is Suzanne Seppo and I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Development and Health and Academic Partnerships. Hello, I'm Anna Spain Bradley and I'm the next Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at UCLA. Like many of you, I'm getting ready to pack up my things and move across the country to Los Angeles. I know that starting college can be daunting and thrilling all at the same time, and it's so much better when we do it together. We are gathering from all around the world and from so many different spaces, from our living rooms and study rooms to our shared bedrooms and garages, our kitchen tables and our backyards. Wherever you are and whoever you are, we see you, we honor your presence in our community, and we are so proud of all that you have accomplished. I want you to know that whether you're living on campus or not in the fall, Residential Life and FYE are working hard to cultivate a welcoming and inclusive community where you will feel like you belong and know that you matter. I miss you dearly being on campus. And while it's not safe for us to do that right now, until then, 
we're gonna make the most of this ruined life. I want you to know that you belong, because you do. Our counseling center, CAPS, has pivoted its services to telehealth, and they are ready to assist you in this unprecedented and unsettling time. So once again, welcome. Remember to wear your mask, stay six feet apart, and even though we are physically distanced, know that we remain Bruin connected. Bruins everywhere, united in our resolve to put good into the world. Welcome to UCLA. See you soon. I care about you. On my first day of class at UCLA, I walked into Chicano Studies 10A and met with Professor Gay Teresa Johnson, a woman with curly hair and the seamless ability to roll her R's, just like me. I learned about spaces of conflict and sounds of solidarity as she taught about interracial struggle and coalition building amongst Black and Chicanx people in the heart of Los Angeles. For the first time, I saw myself reflected in another person and I could finally put names to experiences I had felt my whole life. Growing up, I often felt my identities clash. My AP Spanish teacher questioned if I was in the right classroom in front of everyone, while friends and family would make painful jokes about black people and ask to touch my hair. I struggled to embrace my skin, my hair, and even my body. It wasn't until I was immersed in the amazing communities at UCLA where I found friends who helped me to unlearn these negative thoughts. For the first time in years, I embraced my natural hair and protective styles. Loving my blackness and Latinidad has allowed me to hone my passion for coalition building. When our service workers went on strike, we stood in solidarity with them until the UC agreed to their demands. When the Black Lives Matter movement erupted, I marched with over a thousand students in front of Royce Hall in our masks chanting, say her name. And now, after years of organizing, UCLA is opening a Black Resource Center in the middle of campus this fall. I've seen the power we have when we stand together to create change, leaving UCLA better than we found it, especially for those of us who entered this institution knowing it was built by our people, but not for our people. This power in reclaiming space and building solidarity is what pushed me to run for student government, to continue working with other passionate student leaders, to leverage our collective resources and keep improving our campus. As your student body president, I'm committed to advocating for more students to have a direct voice with administration, to persistently raise issues like accessibility, basic needs, and affordability. The tools and knowledge I've gained in my time here, I know they are all within us. So I ask, when you look back at your college journey, who do you wanna be? Your time here will be one of self-discovery where you'll lose and find yourself many times. If you're open to new experiences and listening to different people, you'll unlearn many of the lessons society has taught us to be true. We're more prepared to show up for others whenever they're in need, when we commit to understanding them, whether it's your best friend spiraling over her midterm or your student government advocating for the renaming of Jan Steps to Tongva Steps. The opportunities to show up for each other happen every day. Yet, this moment has been particularly challenging for all of us. Wherever you are right now, I know this is not how you imagined starting your first year at UCLA, or even your last. This year, we may not be able to dodge flyers on Bruin Walk or run to Panda Express in between lectures, but we can still show up for each other in ways that really matter, even while wearing our masks and staying in our pods. Because one day, this will be over, and we will be in person again, strengthening the coalitions we're building even now. This is Bruin Life. 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 This is Bruin Life.